Okay, I think we'll get started everybody. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to see such a full room of people here on the second day of law school classes. So welcome back for the new year. I'm extremely excited that we have Richard Dicker here to talk to us today. And he's going to be talking about accountability, uh, advancing accountability on a difficult international terrain. I'm just going to give Richard a very, very brief introduction and then really let him dive into what he has to say today because this is a person who has been at the forefront of the development of international justice for more than the past 20 years and so he really is a leading expert and I'm very excited to hear what he has to say today. For those of you that haven't had the pleasure of meeting Richard Dicker yet, he is the Director of Human Rights Watch's International Justice Program since it was founded in 2001. Richard has worked at Human Rights Watch since 1990 and started working on international justice issues in 1994 when Human Rights Watch attempted to persuade several governments to bring a case before the International Court of Justice charging the government of Iraq with genocide against the Kurds. Richard later led the Human Rights Watch multi-year campaign to establish the International Criminal Court and he continues to be closely involved on issues that are important at the ICC. He'll be talking about the, a little bit about the ICC today, but also more broadly about international accountability. So with that, I'd love to pass over to Richard. Thanks. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Um, I have to start by saying uh, uh, how glad I am to be here. Um, and I have been fortunate over several years, uh, many years, uh, going back to uh, uh, an invitation from Professor Steinberg to come and speak uh, at the law school. And uh, it's thrilling to be back again and teaching a, a short course again. I'm, I see that cognizant of the reality that this is a particularly exciting time for UCLA Law School as it ramps up its Promise Institute for Human Rights. And uh, from a practitioner's perspective, I think uh, it's fair to say uh, this institute offers uh, enormous potential in the struggle for human rights and opportunities uh, to do great work uh, uh, for students here. So uh, I really look forward to uh, hearing more about the Promise Institute and sure uh, many, many of you will be uh, involved in it in one way or the other. Um, most all of us here uh, know that over the last 25 years, there had been a remarkable headway in advancing the norm of justice. Um, uh, the most serious international crimes, and by those I mean genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes have been further defined. Those definitions have been applied and interpreted in case law before institutions of criminal accountability for these crimes. These tribunals and courts have been created at the international level as hybrid or mixed tribunals or courts involving both nationals from the country involved as lawyers, investigators, judges, as well as international experts. And in fact, domestic prosecutions for these crimes over the last two decades have been strengthened as well. There is a jurisprudence and a practice that have given rise to expectations and demands for criminal accountability in those situations where crimes occur. I think most all of us also recognize that we are living in a different time than when those institutions were created starting in 1993. 
Uh, that was a decade, a period immediately following the end of the Cold War, a time when some political scientists, I think here in California, in fact, declared that with the triumph of democracy and market capitalism, <coughs> history had come to an end. There was no longer any question as to which system of rule, which system of economics was the preferred one. Uh, the United States was, in the words of uh, the then French foreign minister, a hyper power that dominated a unipolar world where then President uh, George H.W. Bush announced that we had entered a new world order. Um, those terms and predictions uh, look antique uh, as we examine the landscape of human rights, the rule of law, and accountability today. Given this reality, given the current reality, the question that's been very, very much on my mind is where do we go from here uh, amidst what has been an important shift? What are the steps forward in the fight against impunity for the most serious crimes? And I wanted to take the opportunity to share with you a few assessments and questions. I, I can't say they rise to the level of arguments let alone strategies, uh, but I wanted to uh, convey them and get your, your input and thoughts on them. They are two closely linked topics. One, the growing number of country situations characterized by armed conflict, where genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes are ravaging civilian populations in staggering ways and where total, absolute impunity prevails. Countries where, and I have in mind, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, South Sudan, and most recently Myanmar, uh, countries where there is no justice and no immediate prospect of justice, countries that are not, not um, state parties to the Rome Statute of the ICC, and uh, I don't think that's just coincidental that they are non-state parties to the Rome uh, Statute. So that's one topic. Second topic is the International Criminal Court itself, which I feel is under-resourced, under-supported, as well as underperforming. I think the court has been marred by a first decade of um, some understandable mistakes in policy, reputationally, the ICC has been undercut by stiff political opposition <coughs> in its charging of sitting heads of state. And simultaneously, the court is struggling to ramp up its own game as it conducts investigations in 10 countries and is staring at a new investigation in Burundi and possibly another if the judges approve the prosecutor's request, uh, another investigation in Afghanistan. So I want to focus on these two distinct but related areas of impunity and accountability. <coughs> I believe we are facing steep challenges uh, that should not be a cause for despair, but rather careful thinking, strategizing, and uh, 
making the most of the opportunities that arise. So, first topic. Uh, this expanding zone of impunity for the worst crimes. Uh, uh, that represents a trend I think we have to acknowledge. We can't ignore it. Um, uh, as much or as fervently as we want there to be respect for the rule of law and accountability uh, for these kinds of offenses. I want to look at the crimes that are occurring in the countries I mentioned through very different lenses, two very different lenses. One what it looks like from the angle of the Security Council at United Nations headquarters and that council's five permanent members who possess veto power and two, more importantly, what it looks like from the perspective of victims on the ground. Now, let me make two easy predictions at the outset. <coughs> First, there is not likely to be in the foreseeable future the creation by the Security Council of an ad hoc tribunal for Yemen, Myanmar, Iraq, Syria, uh, South Sudan, as there was, of course, for the former Yugoslavia uh, and Rwanda. And second, prediction, and you can see I'm on safe ground here, or sticking to sta safe ground, as much of a poison chalice as they have been for victims and for the ICC, there won't <coughs> be any referrals of these uh, crime situations in these countries by the Security Council to the International Criminal Court, as there were with Darfur and Libya in 2011. Each of the permanent members has <coughs> powerful economic, political, geo geopolitical interests in these countries to protect, uh, uh, and they will use their <coughs> veto power uh, as a means to ensure such protection. In the last few years, the Russian Federation alone has vetoed no less than 11 Security Council resolutions dealing with Syria. And we saw at the end of 2017 the United States exercising its veto power on a resolution uh, following U.S. President Trump's uh, decision and announcement to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So, given the, the obstacles, given the paralysis at the Security Council, a political body indeed, <coughs> what may be a road forward or some elements of a road forward towards accountability. And that is indeed a question that, that I have been, been struggling with as, as an activist. My premise is that we need to think in different ways. We need to think with a long game in mind and with smaller steps that are part, unfortunately, of what will be a slower, longer-term process. I don't want to prescribe rigidity or dogma by precluding unforeseen opportunities that may arise and just uh, insistently uh, predict a long and winding road forward. Um, uh, as I said, we need to be ready to seize opportunities and make the most of them. But in the main, I think we have to prepare for a long-term struggle uh, to bring about accountability 
in some of these countries. Um, I, I'll start with Syria by way of uh, some inkling of way forward. I mentioned Russia's repeated vetoes uh, at the Security Council, and I recall very distinctly, uh, I was there May 22nd, 2014, when under the leadership of France, there was a Security Council resolution to refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. This was really the, the, the cap of mm, five, six years of advocacy by various UN member states at, uh, at the United Nations headquarters. Uh, the vote occurred. It was 13 to 2. The two no votes, not surprisingly, came from the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China, uh, thereby killing the resolution that would have given the International Criminal Court jurisdictional authority to investigate and prosecute crimes on the territory of a non-state party, as Syria has been, to the Rome Statute. Uh, I recall very distinctly that upwards of 50 UN member states who were not members of the Security Council, which of course is limited to 15 members, co-sponsored France's resolution. Nonetheless, uh, uh, that effort ended right there, uh, and the ICC has no authority uh, to do any investigation in Syria. Nevertheless, on December 21st, 2016, the UN General Assembly voted 105 to 15 to establish a mechanism known uh, as the Independent Impartial Investigative Mechanism for Syria. Uh, you can't pronounce the acronym that adds up to, uh, which is indeed unfortunate. But the General Assembly coming right after a Russian veto at the Security Council that occurred at the high point or low point of the bombing of Aleppo and the targeting of food convoy aid being rushed into starving civilians in Aleppo, as well as a broader General Assembly resolution introduced and, and carefully planned by Canada to call for a cessation of bombing in Syria and the full delivery of humanitarian assistance. So all that was going on uh, at the same time in early December 2016. And four days before Christmas, the GA voted on a resolution that was introduced to create this mechanism I referred to with a mandate to collect evidence and compile dossiers for criminal prosecution when venues ultimately become available. Uh, this was, to my eyes, quite a remarkable development, all the more so because the state that spearheaded this resolution was none other than the all-powerful principality of Liechtenstein. Okay. I've been in Liechtenstein. I think they have a population of 55,000 people in total. Um, but uh, what, was, what was striking was a small, tiny state committed to principle and accountability being the locomotive through what I often think of as a, forgive me for this, snake pit 
uh, of the UN General Assembly when it comes to human rights. Liechtenstein, you know, saw the opportunity, seized it, and then brought uh, to um, you know success the adoption of this resolution. Now, why why is this a big deal? You may be asking yourself. It's a big deal because in the effort to establish accountability for crimes in Syria, it takes the work of the Human Rights Council uh, created commission of inquiry um, uh, several steps further. The commission of inquiry that was created, if not in 2011, then in 2012, early on in, in, in the horrors that descended upon Syria, uh, had a mandate to do fact-finding and fact-gathering of human rights violations. And um, of course, the commission was not allowed access into Syria. It nonetheless has done mm, maybe 13, 14 different uh, reports uh, over the last couple of years, uh, uh, has briefed the General Assembly on those reports, has briefed the Security Council on those reports. But what they cannot do is take any action, and this is mandate driven, the Commission of in Inquiry cannot take any action related to criminal accountability. And that's what this new mechanism is authorized to do. Um, uh, so it's a step ahead. Uh, it's a step further. Um, and what I expect is going to happen is that this mechanism, which I, I, I have to say is led by a very impressive French prosecutor, uh, someone who had worked at the Rwanda Tribunal and also the Yugoslav Tribunal, and, and um, is uh, very knowledgeable, very smart, uh, uh, has very little ego in the game, uh, and wants to get um, the job done. This mechanism will, I believe, as it gathers and analyzes volumes of fact-finding that has been done by Syrian human rights activists, by international human rights activists, by the commission of inquiry that I was referring to a moment ago, this new mechanism will work closely with the prosecutors and investigators from 30 plus countries, overwhelmingly European states, that meet twice a year uh, to discuss investigation and prosecution uh, of the most serious crimes under international law, the European Union Genocide Network. And these investigators, the Germans, the French, the Swedes uh, uh, are tasked to bring within their domestic jurisdictions cases of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes committed abroad um, with, for the most part, some linkage or connection, that being presence on French or Swedish or German territory of those accused of the crimes. Um, and what we've seen just in the last year, and, and uh, we published a report in October on the efforts of German and Swedish prosecutors to bring cases against Syrians, now in Sweden, now in Germany, as a result of the refugee flow out of Syria, uh, uh, and that there have been several prosecutions done in Swedish and German courts. Um, and I think the mechanism that I referred to will be interacting closely with these prosecutors 
and exchanging information <coughs> and coordinating efforts so as to give real weight and bite to their investigative and prosecutorial uh, efforts. S these Syrian uh, suspects arrived in these countries, as I said, as part of the refugee flow from Syria. And as happened with Bosnian refugees from that conflict, as happened with Rwandan refugees from that genocide, members of the refugee community in different countries help point out those who might have been involved in the commission of crimes back home who are now uh, refugees as well. And to me, this is a telling demonstration of the use of universal or extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, uh, and it's striking to me, and I, I, I smile as I say this, because this is part of a, a justice component that some, that is universal or extraterritorial jurisdiction, gave up for dead a few years ago. Now, to be, to be objective about it, there are real limitations to these prosecutions. Uh, to date, for the most part, the accused have been low-level <coughs> perpetrators and overwhelmingly from the insurgent side. Um, uh, Bashar al-Assad's cousins uh, have not fled Syria and taken up refugee status in mm -hmm. Sweden or Germany for understandable reasons. So there is not a proliferation of regime side high level suspects to be found uh, in Germany or France or the other countries. Um, nonetheless, prosecutors in Germany and Sweden have opened up what they call structural <coughs> investigations, which are more open-ended, not focused <coughs> on individual suspects, but aimed at more broadly gathering information about crimes, about the chain of command, uh, about the identity of different military or militia units involved or believed to be involved in the commission of these crimes. And hopefully that information, which they will share with their fellow prosecutors, will lead to prosecutions such as France is hoping to open against those most responsible for the crimes documented in what became known as the Caesar report. Caesar was a f prison photographer whose job was to take photos of all those dead in Syrian prisons after photographing, I believe, some mm, tens of thousands of deceased. He decided to flee the country. He hid the photographs with him. Uh, he made it out. Uh, those photographs came into the possession of the foreign minister of France, uh, who was very moved by those photographs and what they represented in terms of the loss of human life. Uh, and that, frankly, is what led France to initiate its effort four years ago on an ICC referral at the Security Council that I mentioned and actually is the driving force behind French prosecutors' efforts to go after those who may be responsible for those deaths. Let me say a word beyond Syria. Uh, and Professor Peake is going to haul me off of this uh, <coughs> platform if uh, I don't finish in a requisite period of time. Um, uh, for Democratic uh, Republic of People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. Very interesting. Uh, commission of Inquiry created 
for that. Um, human rights violations there. A committee of experts in reviewing the Commission of Inquiries report recommended to the Human Rights Council that several criminal investigators be attached to the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Seoul to look at the fact-finding that office was doing of North Korea's human rights violations <coughs> and see what they could do in analyzing and arranging some of that information that could be used for future criminal prosecutions, venues unknown, okay? Um, they drew explicitly from the experience <coughs> I went through a moment ago <coughs> on Syria in creating this criminal investigative capacity uh, beyond just a human rights fact-finding capacity. We'll see what that yields. And then finally, in Yemen, uh, there was at the final meeting of the Human Rights Council in uh, Geneva in 2017, a real fight to create a fact-finding mission for crimes committed or human rights violations <coughs> committed in the conflict in Yemen, where, as you know, a coalition of Arab states led by Saudi Arabia, assisted by the United Kingdom <coughs> and uh, the United States, have carried out incessant indiscriminate bombing attacks on Yemeni civilians, uh, striking homes, markets, and hospitals, blockading uh, ports to shut out urgently needed humanitarian aid uh, and other goods. And um, as a result, seven million people face starvation, and Yemen has nearly one million suspected cases of cholera. Um, I mean, it's hard to imagine uh, a more devastating country and population than exists in Yemen today as a result of armed conflict. At the last session of the Human Rights Council uh, in 2017, um, uh, there was an effort and the Netherlands stepped in and took the lead, ultimately joined by Canada, Belgium, Ireland, and Luxembourg to create this fact-finding mission. The Saudis threatened to cut off diplomatic and political and economic ties with any state in the Human Rights Council uh, that supported the fact-finding mission. Yet, because in part of that threat um, uh, and the mobilizing impact it had on Human Rights Council members, Saudis lost once it became clear that they would not succeed if this recommendation went to a vote. So now, for the first time, we have a group of human rights investigators going to be looking at severe human rights violations in Yemen. Um, a, a small crack initial crack in the impunity that, that, that has marked that, that conflict. Now, do any of these small steps represent a meaningful trend? I think it's too early to say. If these new mechanisms do begin to produce results, they will be small steps on a long road ahead. Um, and I think we need, as I said earlier, uh, to play a long game here, as well as use more proactively and effectively entities like the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. Uh, one lesson I draw from this experience is that it's not the usual champions 
of human rights and accountability. However hypocritical, and I have in mind, of course, the United Kingdom, the US, France, however hypocritical their support for human rights and accountability may have been in the past, or limited is, is probably a better way to put it, um, uh, they have not been in the fore. The efforts have been led uh, by the Principality of Liechtenstein, by the Netherlands, by small states, and the larger, more powerful governments join in once there is some momentum. Let me move on uh, to the ICC in the fight against the community. You recall what I, I said at the outset about the court being under-supported, under-resourced, and underperforming. Um, uh, full disclosure, I've spent the better part of the last 25 years working to get this court established and operational. Human Rights Watch has been and is a firm supporter of the ICC, but we are not a fan club or a cheering section. We work as independent uh, human rights uh, activists and we have our own mandate, which means that when we see shortcomings in court policy and practice, we try to address those in a constructive way. To date, the court has disappointed its most important stakeholders, victims of crimes looking to it for redress in several of the countries where it is carrying on investigations or preliminary examinations. And frankly, it's, its practice and the backlash to its practice has discouraged many of its uh, ardent early supporters. I believe the shortcomings need to change and that it's fair to hold this institution to a high standard. At the same time, perhaps uh, uh, it will seem paradoxical, I believe the success of the ICC or greater success by the ICC is more important today than we would have ever imagined in Rome 20 years ago when the ICC statute was completed after a tumultuous roller coaster five week negotiation there. Yeah. All right. As with all complex institution, there are uh, a combination of factors that underlie the disappointment uh, in its performance. Some are internal to the court, that is policies and practices of the court. Some are more external, the lack of support to arrest suspects, uh, the failure of states parties to turn over documents the prosecutor needs in her investigations or uh, prosecution. All this reflects the reality that this permanent court has an unprecedented challenging mandate and is dependent on the support of its state's parties to function. Um, some of the internal factors I'll just enumerate uh, in, in bullet point. Um, I think some poor policies Originally, investigations were seen as uh, fast uh, uh, with the objective to only gather enough evidence to meet the next statutory burden of proof, whether that was to obtain a warrant of arrest, to get charges confirmed, uh, whatever. This resulted, according <coughs> to uh, the Washington College of Laws, war crimes uh, research office of a rejection by judges at the pre-trial division of nearly 35 percent of the charges at the confirmation <coughs> stage. Um, I think there were poor charging decisions 
leading to cases that were not representative of the most serious crimes alleged. I mean, the first accused tried by the ICC, Thomas Lubanga, uh, uh, whose militia was responsible for murder and mayhem across Ituri province, where some of you have been. Uh, I know Professor Steinberg has been. Um, uh, the charges in that case were recruitment of uh, child soldiers. Um, uh, and there was a disproportionality, if you will, between the charges brought and the crimes committed on the ground attributed to Mr. Lubanga's uh, militia. I think there was a misunderstanding of the drawbacks of soliciting voluntary referrals from state parties, as we saw in Uganda. Um, uh, yes, uh, some cooperation can be guaranteed if a state voluntarily says to the office of the prosecutor, we want you to investigate here in our country. Um, uh, but there is also pressure to limit charges to those who are opponents or armed insurgents against the government. I think there was a misunderstanding of the legacy, the very bitter legacy of colonial rule in Africa and how that could be used to play against the ICC. Those were some of the internal factors. And, and this was a new institution trying to do something that had never been done before. I think some mistakes were inevitable. Um, uh, and those work together with um, uh, external factors. Of course, I don't want to omit exceedingly slow proceedings. That first trial uh, that I referred to, I think uh, on the three counts of recruitment of child soldiers took some four years. Um, um, some of the external factors, and I, I will pick up the pace here, is uh, the lack of, of real support from states' parties. And you can see this reflected through the Security Council, which after the referral of the horrific crimes in Darfur and the situation in Libya six years later, made like it never had heard of the International Criminal Court. There were no Security Council resolutions, presidential statements adopted to say this council supports the prosecutor in his or then her work in Darfur. It was complete silence. The Security Council wouldn't even respond to communiques from judges at the court signing instances of non-cooperation by certain UN member states in uh, regard to Darfur and Libya. I mean, shocking, uh, but that is the nature of the, of the council. It also tainted the court, unfortunately. Uh, those two referrals gave the idea, I think wrongly, uh, to some that the court was a plaything of the permanent members of the Security Council. And that became a, a strand in the criticism directed against the ICC. Uh, lack of sufficient funding, uh, I'm glad to talk about that, but it's uh, getting to the point of being so ugly that one cannot but suspect that some of the deep pocket states parties, and I'm thinking particularly of France, uh, Japan, uh, uh, United Kingdom, use their control over the budget as a way actually to interfere with the independence of choices made by the prosecutor. Good news, progress is being made. Um, uh, uh, early policies that did not work well are being uh, corrected so that investigations are being conducted so that they are complete 
and ready for trial, I, I think that's, that is a phrase every prosecutor uses. We are trial ready, and I, I, I think there's probably real distance uh, between that uh, assertion and the completeness of the, the dossier. But, but the cases are being investigated more thoroughly uh, so that they are able to go forward. I think uh, necessarily there's been an expansion of investigations out of Africa, which is needed. Not that the crimes there didn't deserve or merit attention from the ICC prosecutor, but indeed crimes of the same gravity have occurred in other country situations. The prosecutor has opened an investigation in Georgia, in the Caucasus, that could implicate military commanders, officials in Moscow. Who knows? Uh, and as I referred to, she has requested permission to open an investigation in Afghanistan that could implicate U.S. armed forces uh, and central intelligence agency operatives in crimes there. In seeing that, I mean, the people of Afghanistan have suffered horrifically over uh, uh, so many years and, and, and certainly no let up since Afghanistan became a state party to the Rome Statute. Uh, the crimes alleged to have been committed by U.S. forces are a tiny fraction of what the Taliban, uh, more recently ISIS, and the Afghan security forces and many personal militias have done, uh, uh, or, or uh, abuse inflicted on Afghan civilians. Nonetheless, I believe, controversial view, uh, it is important for the prosecutor to keep that very small set of crimes on the agenda, not simply ignore them because of their relatively limited numerosity. Um, so we've got investigations out of Africa, we've got uh, <coughs> judges, ah, judges who were initially former diplomats. You know, and I, I work with diplomats. I like diplomats. But that doesn't necessarily make them uh, that well prepared to manage complex criminal proceedings. Uh, uh, we saw some, let me call them wannabe judges, uh, at the pretrial chamber of the ICC write 800 page opinions confirming charges against one or another accused. Um, uh, and the judges, the quality and experience of judges at the ICC is improving. Uh, uh, states are nominating more qualified individuals. And in December, <coughs> six judges were elected as Six will leave the bench in, in February. And for the most part, these are jurists who know their way around a courtroom. You know, and that will make a difference in expediting the proceedings in a way that <coughs> adheres to uh, important fair trial guarantees. So I think that's good news. I mean, we are seeing a strengthened unit for the protection of victims and witnesses. All that's good. That said, I think reputationally the court will be digging itself out of a deep hole. Um, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, and the first impression made by the ICC uh, uh, hasn't been uh, a positive one um, in the way I would have hoped. Um, uh, but I think through enhanced practice, that can change over now, uh, over time. Um, almost at the end, just to say, look 
before at the court, what happens by way of arrests in regard to the second investigation in Cote d'Ivoire, um, looking into accused who were militarily on the side of now President Ouattara in the struggle against former Ivorian President Bagbo, uh, a much more sensitive, difficult investigation for the ICC to conduct. It's been going on for a while. We are hoping for results so that the justice the ICC renders in that country is not perceived as selective. Uh, look for the results of the investigation in Central African Republic into both um, Seleka, uh, the predominantly Muslim militia that uh, seized power and committed attacks against Christian communities, and the anti Balaka, the predominantly Christian, very loose militia group uh, that grew up in response. Both have committed uh, crimes in the course of that conflict. ICC has been investigating that for some time. Uh, I think the results there will be an important benchmark. I'm going to skip over, because of time, uh, this upcoming 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute um, uh, and the opportunities I think that affords the court uh, officials and its uh, supporters. Um, and I'm going to wrap up on uh, the point about on the larger canvas, I think we've got to turn to small states to really take the lead. I think in the current political environment globally, leadership is going to have to come from the Principality of Liechtenstein, from Slovenia, uh, uh, from Switzerland, from Costa Rica, from Botswana, uh, in championing uh, uh, human rights and accountability efforts, including as state parties of the ICC, and bring others along in their momentum, uh, or through the momentum they create. So let me wrap up. I'm sure I've gone on far too long. Um, it's a difficult period. Um, but we have norms, we have institutions that can be wielded and used. Um, I think our goals need to remain ambitious, but also realistic, given the time period we're in and the politics of the moment. Uh, I think the victories will be less dramatic and less large scale. And there will be more defensive battles. Um, but there is no reason or need for a cry of despair. Really uh, uh, a smart strategic call to action. And this effort will need all of you. I'm sorry, Professor, I went on too long. It's OK. We still have 20 minutes for questions. OK. <laughs> Apologies. So please, I'm very, very keen to get your questions, comments, arguments, uh, et cetera. And I think <coughs> what we'll do is take a couple at a time um, rather than uh, do it one on one, if that's OK. So who's going to break the ice here? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, thank you. Of course, uh, thank you for your talk. It sounds like the situation is pretty ugly right now with the patchwork accountability. And you started the talk harkening back to history, end of the Cold War. Do you think there's anything that the US or maybe major players in the United Nations or, or any other country could have done differently in the 20th century to make the situation different right now? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. That is a big question. Okay. Uh, uh, 
some others to, to give me a moment to think on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, please. Um, perhaps sort of related to that, but um, thinking about the universal jurisdiction and um, the opportunities for domestic courts to shoulder some of the burden of prosecutions that the international community is unwilling or unable to undertake. Um, what can be done to support countries like Sweden and Germany that are attempting to undertake universal jurisdiction prosecutions? Yeah. yeah. Great question. Thanks. And maybe we'll take one more in this round. Yes. What do you think will happen if this trend of African countries the war from the court continues and the decision of the heads of states on the EU summit never materializes to actually empower their African court to take on these cases? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, really uh, thought provoking issues raised by, by all of the questions. Um, let me uh, respond to the, the first um, about what could have been differently, done differently at the end of the 20th century. I think what could have been done differently, what should have been done differently by the United States, uh, by the United Kingdom, um, uh, is to be much more forthright about possible crimes it had committed, it might have been implicated in, uh, in, in recent, <coughs> recent times, and say, you know, um, this movement for accountability um, that began in 1993, you know, makes us look more closely and carefully at our own practices. And frankly, to its credit, uh, parts of the U.S. military did that, you know, in, in looking at its manuals for when to uh, uh, permit bombing of such and such target. Um, and tried, there was some effort to bring U.S. military practice closer in line with um, uh, war crimes of indiscriminate bombing of civilians. I think had the United States been more publicly forthcoming and say, hey, this is a great thing, you know, we're going to do everything we can to bring our practice in line with these emerging norms. That would have taken away the power, some of the power of the argument that justice only applies against weaker states or individuals from weaker states. The powerful state leadership never gets touched by this international uh, justice or accountability. Frankly, as much as I respected him, and uh, I think President Obama made a serious misstep early, uh, early on when he said, regarding crimes committed, we want to look forward, not look backward. You know, that was essentially uh, whitewashing everything the U.S. military may have done wrong in Afghanistan and Iraq and sent the wrong signal, not a forthcoming signal and an honest signal. I think that would have helped. I don't think it would have eliminated the, the double standards that the powerful don't get prosecuted, uh, but I think it would have given more space for the equal application of the law. So that's, that's one thought. Um, what can be done to support these states that are applying universal jurisdiction <coughs> provisions? I mean, it's one lesson we've learned is the importance of governments creating these specialized war crimes units that are mandated to investigate and prosecute these types of crimes. 
Uh, I recently met with the French prosecutor. She was uh, in New York. Um, and it's clear she is doing everything she can because she has a unit to support her that includes police investigators, that includes immigration officials that all work together as part of this team. I think the message <coughs> that needs to be sent is that states need to form these specialized units because these crimes their investigation and prosecution, particularly far away from where the crimes occurred, cannot be left to ordinary police investigators or ordinary prosecutors. So I think uh, our approach is very much uh, to publicly support these units and the work that they are doing and press them to engage in a cooperative way with the refugee population that are uh, on their territory. Uh, but it costs money, you know, and money is in tight, tight supply. Uh, or so they think. Um, and in terms of the African states, I think there are important lessons uh, to learn from that experience. I think um, there were a few African heads of state, particularly Omar al-Bashir uh, of Sudan, uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda, and then Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya, that, that promoted this notion that the court was biased against African leaders. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do so because of several things. Primarily, uh, the, the, the horrific history of centuries of colonial rule in Africa, and the fact that there were no trials in European countries for uh, individuals involved in colonial uh, adventures that led to the deaths of many, many people. Uh, uh, there was an unevenness there. And, and Kenyatta and al-Bashir really played on that for all it was worth. What that obscured was what we finally saw in November 2016 at the annual meeting of the Courts Assembly of States Parties, where you had 16 African states stand up and say, hey, this court isn't perfect. It's got its problems, but we're not leaving. It's our court, and we're sticking by it. And I think what's interesting is things really hit a, a crisis moment, of course, as your question reflected, uh, when South Africa, Burundi, and the Gambia announced they were all withdrawing with the prospect that this was going to trigger a mass withdrawal of African states from the ICC. I think there was a lot of inflation involved in that talk of mass withdrawal. We've seen what's happened since. Yes, Burundi on October 27th uh, withdrew from the Rome Statute. That did not insulate it from an investigation by the prosecutor. The Gambia, as a result of a democratic election, withdrew its uh, notification of withdrawal. And South Africa, I would say in no small part due to the very creative work of South African uh, public interest lawyers, challenged the South African government in court. Uh, and the high court found that the procedure the government was using to withdraw was unlawful. Um, and that it had to start again. Um, uh, subsequently, we haven't seen a renewal of effort. And I would suggest President Zuma has enough on his plate to keep him busy for as long as he's in office than to try to press through the African National Congress uh, uh, a withdrawal from the International Criminal Court. We'll see what happens. If South Africa were to withdraw, 
no ifs, ands, and buts about it, it would be a serious, serious blow to the port because South Africa is an important country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Do you think that the uh, court has uh, strengthened itself or weakened itself by broadening the scope of its jurisdiction to include uh, crime of aggression? Ooh. Okay. Uh, next question. <laughs> we'll come back to that, Professor. Yes. So you mentioned that the court was constructed and begun during a time when the U.S. was sort of a hyper unipolar power um, in the world. Um, and that's obviously, if it's not the case, it's rapidly becoming less and less the case now. And I'm just wondering how, in a world when it seems like there's increasing likelihood or talk of kind of parallel institutions being set up in multiple spheres, how the court can maintain um, or reachieve sort of more universal relevance going forward. Right. Yeah. Fair question. Anyone else to finish off this round of three? Um, jumping off of the Hussein Halbrink case, I was yeah. wondering how, what your thoughts are on the strengthening of regional justice mechanisms, uh, possibly as a addition to the ICC and the existing um, regional um, court mechanisms for human sure. rights, but more towards criminal uh, investigations. Right. Okay, thanks for all those. And uh, I'm not going to duck the professor's question on the crime of the <laughs> um, uh, Human Rights Watch, as a human rights organization, uh, and one that monitors the uh, adherence to international humanitarian law in our conflicts does not, has not, does not and will not take a position on the lawfulness of the initiation of an armed conflict. Uh, so, Iraq invades Kuwait in 1990. Um, we didn't have anything to say about Saddam Hussein's unlawful uh, invasion of Kuwait. What we looked at was the conduct of Iraqi troops in Kuwait. Um, so, uh, you know, we are really a use bellow oriented organization. That being the case, we never took a position on the advantage or disadvantage to the court of uh, defining and making operational this crime of repression. Uh, we weren't for it, we weren't against it. That's rather atypical for us. Uh, we usually have a voice that we, we, we use, but for those principled reasons, we didn't get involved in that debate. I think, um, as your question reflects, of course, the recent Assembly of States parties meeting took the decision, and I think it was at 1.45 in the morning, uh, way after uh, the clock had stopped for the meeting, to indeed activate the crime of progression. I have to say, it is circumscribed by so many limitations that probably the first case will be when Switzerland invades Austria, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not until then. So in the real world, we'll see uh, whether or not this will take shape at the uh, Some states, frankly, were quite emotionally, I shouldn't say emotionally, historically, jurisprudentially, because of the link with Nuremberg, uh, attached and committed to its activation. I don't think in real world purposes it's going to have much. Um, be an interesting question to pose to the judges. See what they say, the prosecutor as well. Um, okay. Uh, 
I think the question about, you know, U.S., the hyperpower, unipolar world, I'm not a political scientist, so I wouldn't dare make uh, predictions, uh, but I think that is an apt description that you gain from changes in the world. Um, uh, the U.S. is less of a unipower, uh, uni hyperpower today. Um, and I see some real downsides to that uh, in terms of championing, even with the hypocrisy, even with the double standard, uh, the way my friend and former State Department ambassador Stephen Rapp did. Stephen Rapp, who was U.S. war crimes ambassador in the Obama years, that guy traveled uh, nearly a million miles from from uh, you know the capital of the Central African Republic to uh, Eastern Congo to Sri Lanka, etc., trying to encourage and promote genuine accountability, and that's the the absence of that voice will be will be felt and missed, you know, and it's going to make a difference in a way that's not possible. You know? uh, how it's all going to settle out, I don't know. But I, I do know um, uh, it, it's important for other states to, to do all they can, even though they are not. The Principality of Liechtenstein certainly is not uh, uh, a superpower. Smaller states need to take the initiative and feel emboldened and empowered, uh, supported by civil society to do so. You know, uh, how all that is going to play out, uh, I wouldn't even pretend to myself to know. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see uh, over time. Uh, for accountability and justice, uh, I don't think it's going to be a positive. Um, uh, Hissen Habre and the Extraordinary African Chamber, I would say, really, no, I'm being a bit facetious here, the more courts, the better, you know? But, with this caveat, not courts that have as part of their statute exceptions for sitting heads of state, mm -hmm. um, as the proposed African Criminal Court uh, does have. Um, what would be the policy outcome of that? It would encourage even more heads of state to extend their terms in office mm -hmm. to better insulate themselves from uh, criminal accountability on these charges. Uh, it would be a serious regression in law, I believe, as well. Um, I think uh, the accountability of sitting heads of state for these kinds of crimes is a settled question. So yes, if there were courts that were created that had statutes in, uh, faithful to uh, uh, norms that have been codified in other statutes and worked out a complementarity relationship with the ICC. My goodness, uh, there are many more crimes being committed, many more victims in Africa than the ICC is ever going to be able to deal with. So I think it's potentially a good thing, but not at the cost of turning the clock back on law and in policy terms with the easily predictable negative consequences. The Habre case was, uh, yeah, as the name suggested, uh, an extraordinary chambers. Uh, and I'd love to see that extended uh, and become operational uh, more frequently. I'm not sure it's going to happen. In, in the, something interesting to keep your eye on uh, and I'm not optimistic, is the proposed hybrid court for South Sudan. 
that was part and parcel of the African Union negotiated peace agreement mm -hmm. between uh, the contending forces in South Sudan. And interestingly, the creation of this proposed hybrid court, which has, there's a statute, but it has died in the hands of uh, cabinet ministers in Juba who might likely be accused before this court if it ever takes shape. Interesting to note, the insistence on the court and accountability was a direct result of former Nigerian President Obasanjo, who led the peace negotiations uh, in South Sudan. Uh, he insisted on that uh, language because he said if there is not going to be an accountability, this will recur all over again. Uh, I hope this hybrid <laughs> tribunal uh, or court gets off the ground. I am not optimistic. That mm -hmm. not. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. And, and just, I, I should have said this uh, happily for me. Uh, I'm going to be here for three weeks and glad to chat with any of you bilaterally, you know, in small groups, etc. So uh, I'm on my law. Uh, so uh, send me an email and I'm really glad to uh, sit together and, and talk. Thanks.